If you go down to the woods today, you're sure for a big surprise. Especially if you're the protagonist in tonight's story. Well, so nice of you to join me around the campfire again. You know how much I enjoy it when you come along. It cheers me up no end to have company around the fire. Well, tonight's story is horrific, tragic, sad, and scary. Now, come in a little closer, because I've got a story to tell you. It goes something like this. Tonight's story doesn't take place on the land, but the area surrounding it. See, it wasn't just the land that was evil. It was the whole damn area. I feel disgusted with myself for writing this, and I've been writing on it for about three days, trying to figure out the best way to convey the horror and get this off my chest. It was spring and in the woods. Spring is very colorful and noisy. Everything is blooming, killing you with allergies. And all the animals are shouting out that they want to get laid. We had a few spring showers and the temperature was rather mild. Topping at around 78 for the whole season. Thomas was a 17 year old boy who, like most kids in my area, like to fish out of a big creek, aptly named Big Creek, at the center of the conglomeration of small towns. Big Creek ran through the woods for about 30 or so miles, and was almost wide enough to be called a river. If you're familiar with the Spring River, it was about half as wide as that at its widest point. I always imagined that if they hadn't called it Big Creek, they would have called it Little River. Anyway, Thomas was the best fisherman of us all. He was older than my brother, of whom I was younger, but we all still hung out despite our age differences. Thomas, or Tommy, loved the outdoors. Well, you know the expression, you can take the man out of the woods, but you can't take the woods out of the man. Well, that was Tommy in a nutshell. As with most kids in this area, Tommy had dropped out of school about a year prior to help around the farm. <laughs> yeah, this town was really backwards. But that didn't hinder our friendship. In fact, Tommy was one of our best friends. We'd met Tommy about a year after we moved to the land, and initially I thought he was an asshole. Our first meeting was, <laughs> well, it ended up in a bad way for me and some unfortunate bastards. I've always been able to see things, glimpses of bad things to come. I get this from my mother, but both that and our first meeting with Tommy are two completely separate stories. The point is, Thomas was one of our first friends. He and my brother went to school together for a few years until Tom decided to drop out. I know calculus and chemistry and stuff. I'm educated without a diploma. He'd said one day, as we met at our fishing spot. My brother and I looked at him, flabbergasted. So, Tommy dropped out and spent his days working at his uncle's farm, fishing with us, camping and mudding over the dirt roads on which we lived. Tommy was always full of energy and was a very excitable person. He had a passion for wildlife and woodlands and conservation which was something that threw me for a loop when he dropped out. He told us that his uncle was trying to repair the damages he'd done, and that he needed help around the farm if they wanted to enjoy the simple things in life, such as eating and having clean water. His uncle was not a nice man. In fact, it was a miracle that Tommy was even able to live with him, as he'd been convicted of doing something very nasty with two 14-year-old girls back in 83 the worst part about it, as if it needed to be worse, was the fact that they were his nieces. He had been sent away until 95, whereupon he was released on good behaviour. After that, he just kind of melted into the woods, 
living off an inheritance and raising a farm. Tommy hated his uncle, and his uncle hated Tommy. Many were the nights where Thomas would just camp at his favourite site, about a mile down from our fishing spot. Tommy often told and showed us the signs of his abuse, such as cigarette burns in the middle of his back, missing teeth or teeth that were broken in half, and the worst one, toenails that had been separated from the flesh via a spike of some sort. I didn't dare think about how his uncle had managed that. A month or so after Tommy turned 18, something in him changed. We noticed something was off one day when Tommy showed up at our fishing spot with bags under his eyes. He wasn't his usual peppy self, but instead it was like he hadn't slept in a month. We knew that wasn't the case because we'd all hung out at the same spot about two days beforehand, and he'd been fine. My brother and I stood barefoot on a large, slippery rock that jutted out over the bank of the creek. This part of the creek was good for fishing flat-head catfish, as it was both deep and a bit cloudy due to the looseness of the shoreline. About an hour into our fishing, we heard someone approaching through the woods and turned to see Tommy walking toward us, a wooden fishing rod in one hand and a tackle box in the other. His hair was a ragged mess, as usual, but his face was grey and his eyes baggy, which wasn't at all usual. Hey, Tommy, you look like shit, man. What's up? My brother asked, a joking edge to his voice. Tommy just grunted at us. Oh, just had a rough night, he replied. He stood on the bank next to our rock, his flip-flops digging into the silt. He didn't really talk the entire time which was odd because he usually chatted us up to the point where we were afraid he'd drive away all the fish. When we pried deeper to try and find the source of our friend's strange behaviour, he just gave us the same answers as before. Three hours into fishing, Tommy looked at his watch, something he never did when the fish were biting, and packed up his things. He hadn't caught anything, and by now he should have snatched five or six fish out of the water. I have to go. I'll see you two later. And with that, Tommy was gone. We didn't see Tommy again for a long time. Tommy was reported missing by his uncle. No one knew why he didn't live with his parents, but it was assumed he didn't want to live in a divorced family. It was common for kids around this area to go out with friends for camping or hunting expeditions for days at a time. But Tommy had never been gone for more than a week, and his mother was growing concerned. His uncle had told police that he'd simply run off one night, and that he was growing concerned for the boy. The police, which were state police, as there was no station for this small town of ours, searched for Tommy for three or four days, organising search parties of locals and out-of-towners who knew Tommy and wanted to help. They looked in all the common haunts. His mum's place, his dad's place, our fishing spot, his favourite camping site. There was no trace of him anywhere. One night our brother and I were outside roasting marshmallows over the coals of a fire that had burned out a little bit before. Tommy was on our minds, but we figured he'd finally just moved away with another relative, as there was a rumour that his uncle wasn't the most gentle of souls. So, in our minds, Tommy was okay. At this point, he'd been gone for about two months. We did miss him, however, and fishing just wasn't the same without him. As we sat on our log stools, roasting the confectionaries over the glowing coals and gazing up at the stars, we heard scuffling from our side. We lived on a massive hill that was about three miles wide. We only encompassed about two acres of it, and about 700 feet at its highest point. To our left was a neighbour, and to our right was bare woods for about half a mile. This stretch of woods was where the scuffling came from, and, despite leaning over hot coals, a 
chill ran through my chest and my head became swamped with dread. Have you ever woken up and knew, without a doubt, you were probably going to die that day? Well, that feeling was me in that moment. But I didn't fear any specific thing. It was just there. Step. Drag. Step. Drag. Step. We heard whoever it was shuffle off into the forest. Leaves and sticks snapping and crunching underfoot. They disappeared into the woods and we went back to roasting our marshmallows. Then, about five minutes later, we heard something grind, like the sound of a sarcophagus lid opening in a Hollywood movie. It shrieked through the night for a brief instant like an injured animal, and silence formed in its wake. We didn't hear anything after that, but I still went to bed with an uneasy feeling. For about a month, nothing became of it, and I just kind of forgot about it after that. The following year felt a bit empty without Tommy. We still went fishing out at the creek, and sometimes went camping, but it just felt weird. Mind you, we still thoroughly enjoyed it. Tommy's mother kind of just faded into the background and his name was whispered only in reflective conversations of people with nothing better to do than talk about the past. It was a lazy autumn afternoon, about a year and a half later. We were on Thanksgiving break, and, to our surprise and joy, the school had allotted us two weeks of vacation. But if we knew what we would find on that break, oh, we would have gladly gone to school instead. I was laying on the floor, playing with my Legos and listening to old rock on my radio, which had a rigged antenna made from aluminum foil and a wire coat hanger. My brother was splicing together some of his duplicate Kid Rock and Limp Biscuit cassettes to make <laughs> the best fucking mixtape ever. Our parents were in the den, reading and talking about boring adult stuff. Yeah, I'm bored. I declared as I let my bionicle fall to his death in a fiery lava pit, betrayed by his brother. Yeah, me too, man. Want to go hiking or something? I hadn't been out hiking since school started, so I said yes without hesitation. We told our parents our plans, and they said to be home before midnight. They were pretty lax despite all the bullshit on the land. The woods around us were vast once you got past the neighbours and stuff. There were some pretty cool sights, too. For example, there was a waterfall about a mile from our trailer that fell over the entrance to a shallow cave. It was rumoured that a black bear lived there, but after thorough investigation by my dad and his friends, it was confirmed that the only thing inhabiting the cave was a bunch of raccoons. We gathered a few supplies, such as a handful of Slim Jims each, <laughs> Pepsi, flashlights, and my dad let my brother take his pellet gun, in case anything tried to come out of us. We adorned our hiking boots, jeans and flannel shirts, and set out. The evening was fading fast into twilight. What golden rays of sun were left pierced the sparse canopy of gold and red and purple leaves as a calm breeze smelling of decaying wood whispered through the trees. Birds chirped away, and the sound of leaves and twigs crunching under our feet was music for my soul. We were about a quarter mile into the half-mile stretch of woods next to our house, when my brother asked the question. You want to go to Tommy's? I hadn't thought about Tommy in nearly a month, and the sudden thought of going to his old house just kind of sent a cold breeze through my very being. Why? It'd be cool. Besides, we might find something. Like what? Uh, I don't know. Just something. Reluctantly, I agreed. We continued on through the stretch of woods. Tommy's house was about two miles from our own. Six if you took the roads instead of cutting through the woods. 
We crossed over streams and a ravine, through thick clusters of blackjack trees and down inclines that dropped off without warning. The forest was beautifully haunting in the twilight. The sun had fallen beneath the horizon, but it was still light enough to not have to use our flashlights. After about an hour, we reached Tommy's place. Tommy had lived in a single-story house with an attached garage and a large barn behind it. The house was white and stood out against the dark fields behind it, which seemed to go on forever. It wasn't nearly as big as a standard farmhouse, but it was more than most people in the area had, as we were mostly confined to trailers. I felt the same sense of dread I had on that night a year and a half ago. But there was something different about it. It felt like we were being watched. If you don't look, it can't get you, I told myself as I felt the darkness of the woods creep up on me from behind. We crossed the dirt road separating the woods from Tommy's yard, and soon we were standing in front of the house. No one could afford alarm systems, and we were so far removed from society that they would be a waste of money anyway, so getting into the house was not a problem. I was an avid lockpick, and within a minute the front door swung open for us. The first thing I noticed was the stench. Good Lord, the stench was terrible. I pulled my shirt over my nose and stepped in. Clicking on my flashlight, it cast an eerie yellow orb to the white interior walls of the house, the darkness masking everything out that wasn't illuminated. That place was dirty. The floor was littered with fallen pictures and boxes of half-packed, as if someone had had to leave before they could carry the boxes away. Spiders inhabited the corners of the house in nearly every room, and beetles crawled over the furniture. Other than the litter, the house seemed to be in order. Three sofas sat in the den, surrounding a giant box TV. The den smelled musty and the ticks of beetles flying caused my skin to itch. But there was nothing unusual. My brother stayed by me, his pellet gun at the ready. It was a pistol model, so in the other hand he too held his light. We moved on to the bedrooms. What we presumed to be his bedroom was lined with corn and saliva and Metallica posters, along with a full collection of books such as The Odyssey and Iliad, and currently released Harry Potter books, and an ample collection of mystery and old westerns. It was a bit surprising to find that Tommy had enjoyed reading, it seemed, almost as much as us. It was like we were discovering a whole new side of Tommy. His bed was made and his closet was full of clothes. I found it odd that Tommy would leave, and leave all his stuff behind. We moved on to the next bedroom, but the door was either blocked or jammed. This only made the dread in my gut heighten. Why would a bedroom door be jammed? Not wanting to press the matter, we quietly walked to the kitchen, the floorboards creaking beneath our boots whining in resistance that they had not been oppressed in nearly two years. As we approached the threshold for the kitchen, the stench grew stronger. Rot filled my nostrils and my brother gagged, bending over to catch his breath. We reluctantly entered the kitchen and immediately discovered the source of the smell. The freezer atop the fridge was open slightly and, from it, ran a river of black goop. It had sloshed down the front of the fridge, its black a stark contrast to the pale white in my flashlight's beam. Hey, I dare you to open it, my brother said, holding his nose so that he sounded like Stitch. Ugh, no, you open it. Rock, paper, scissors? We set our lights on the kitchen table facing us, and played RPS for the honor of not opening the freezer. He won. 
Grabbing my light, I made my way to the fridge unit, my flashlight bouncing off of it and leaving long, ominous shadows on the cheap plyboard wall behind it. Drawing in a deep breath through my mouth, I opened it. Slags of black squelched out and onto the dirty linoleum floor. More of the black goop rushing out to greet me. It splashed onto my shoes, and not even my shirt could stop the smell. God. It was awful. We ran out of there and I wiped my shoes on a towel I snatched from the table. After that, we decided to visit the barn, as the garage had been observed to be barren of anything save a few shovels and pickaxes. The barn, however, was another story. The moon was out as a waxing crescent, but it was bright enough to cast a silver glow in the darkness, giving everything a pretty, yet chilling, white aura. The stars were out as well, and, with no lights on, we could see what seemed like the ends of the universe. The barn opened easily enough, a simple sliding wooden door. It smelled of decayed hay and moisture, but it was a far cry from the awfulness of the kitchen. We cast our lights on a red, rusty tractor, and a bunch of sinister-looking farm equipment. The barn didn't have a hayloft, so luckily we didn't have to climb up or anything. We made our way around the back of the tractor, and found ourselves looking at an old, worn-out tarp. It was stained with what looked like mud, as it was a real ruddy brown. The mud had dried out completely, as it was really flaky to the touch. That's when I noticed the sickle, the hacksaw, and the two-by-four. The former two of the three were caked in mud, like they'd been dropped there and one of the summer storms had caused them to get dirty. The floor of the barn was ground, so it was easy to put the two together. But then we found it. My brother grabbed some of the hay to throw at me and succeeded, but something hard hit me in the head. Hey, asshole, don't throw rocks at me, I blurted out into the otherwise silent night. I didn't. Yeah, then what the hell is this? I reached down into the clump of wet hay and pulled out the rock. Only, it wasn't a rock. At first I thought it was an old piece of wood that had been whittled down to a rough ellipse. Then I saw the hole in the middle and dropped it as quickly as I'd picked it up, shuddering and shrieking like I'd just been attacked. Dude, what's up? My brother inquired, alarmed. Spine. Spine. Whoa. <sighs> he threw back the hay and revealed a grotesque ribcage just lying in the hay. It was too small and too flat to belong to a pig or cow. This was definitely human. The dread reached an all-time high, and I was certain that whatever I felt watching us would soon pounce. We have to go, and we have to go right now, I demanded. Hold on. No, right now, Andrew. Suddenly, a wailing sound tore through the night. A wail that belonged to someone when they witnessed a loved one get murdered. A wail that only the damned were capable of producing. We ran. We ran through the woods, up the hills, and through the rivers at a lightning pace, our adrenaline keeping us from falling and stumbling. I heard something almost galloping behind us, kicking up leaves and mulch and snorting as it breathed. I didn't dare look back, as I knew a moment's lapse would have me fall victim to whatever it was. We burst forth from the tree line and ran into the trailer, locking the door behind us. We told our parents the story, and they grew more serious than I'd ever seen them before. They didn't scold us for breaking and entering Tommy's house, but instead called the police and told them that, in our youthful state of exploration and concern for our friend, we had ventured to our friend's house and snuck into the barn, where we found the bones. My brother and I, never heard any reprimand from the police for our trespasses. Four months after the incident, we found out that the bones had belonged to Tommy's uncle, 
and that more were found in the septic tank behind the house. The limbs had shown teeth marks, consistent with those of the hacksaw we found on the tarp. Also, the tarp wasn't muddy. It was his uncle's dried blood. This made me real in horror realizing that I had touched someone's blood. You'd think after I helped my dad bury the boy several years past that I'd be over gross and disturbing stuff, but no, that was not the case. These things, these events, never really calloused me. The newspaper reported that the whole body of Tommy's uncle had been accounted for, as had Tommy's left foot as it was found in the septic tank. Well, Almost all of his uncle's body. The head was missing. Because Tommy's foot was among the remains, the investigators closed the case locally, saying that he was probably dead too. His mother was grief-stricken. After holding out hope that her little boy had been safe at some location unbeknownst to her for so long, only to have that hope snuffed out like a dream upon waking, she fell to despair and ended up painting the walls of her bathroom with a 10-gauge while she was shitting. Now Tommy, his mom, and his uncle were dead. His dad, though long divorced from his wife, still loved his family, and he too fell to despair. As his two friends told it, they went to check on him one day to find him sitting at the kitchen table with a revolver in his mouth. He smiled and waved at them, and then blew his brains out. The two friends didn't talk much after that, and eventually they moved away, separately. Needless to say, this saturation of death shook the Tri-County area, and it was the buzz for a good four months, toward the end of which was the time my brother and I decided to go hiking again. We hiked the same stretch of woods, but didn't go anywhere near Tommy's place. It was afternoon, and the early summer breeze danced through the lush green trees. It had been almost three years since Tommy went missing. We hadn't fished in about a year, because it had just gone boring, even when we would sneak beers from the fridge. We decided to go hiking just to do something, but agreed to stay far away from Tommy's place. We grabbed our flashlights and a bunch of Slim Jims, which had become our favorite treat for hiking. Andy also grabbed Dad's pellet gun, just in case we ran into anything small and nasty and needed to scare it off. We'd been hiking about 45 minutes when Andy spotted something as we were circling back to our trailer. Dude, come check this out. It's like a well or something. I ran over to where he stood and saw a large metal well sticking out of the earth. Next to it was a cover, like a manhole cover or something. It was covered in rust and had sunken into the ground. Ants marched across its black surface in a frenzy at our presence. Andrew took out his flashlight and shone it down to the bottom, where he saw something floating. It wasn't too deep and we could have easily gotten it out with a branch that was long enough. But we were interrupted by silence. The birds had stopped singing, and the bugs had stopped making noise. Even the wind fell silent. That's when we heard something being dragged across the ground. Sticks and rocks and acorns were pushed aside as it moved. Step, step. Drag, step, 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 drag, step. The sound continued for about a minute, and we were frozen in place, my heart racing. Andy touched my arm and pointed to a small cluster of trees. What I saw made my blood run cold. There, in the trees, was a naked man crawling on all fours. His face was too far away to make out clearly, but it appeared to be scarred. He was pale, chalky, and looked sickly 
as we could see his ribs beneath his gaunt skin. The man moved toward us, and as he grew closer, I could see that his nose was missing, and in its place was a fleshy hole, filled with ants and blisters. He was five feet from us when my brother spoke. Tommy? The beast turned its head like a curious child, its bloodshot eyes piercing my brother. As the man breathed, snot flew from his skull and dribbled down his cracked lips. It spoke, its cheeks huffing and its eyes darting back and forth between Andy and I as it did. Tommy, 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 Tommy. It licked the snot from its lips and backed away, scratching its rear as it did so. That's when I noticed that the man's left leg was missing. Oh, God, this was Tommy. Tommy suddenly let out a wail and lunged for my brother. He missed, and my brother grabbed my arm. Run, just run. Before he could even get his feet off the ground, Tommy had grabbed my brother by his ankle and was dragging him away like a coyote hauling in a kill. My brother screeching at the top of his lungs like a kill that wasn't all the way dead. I stood there, frozen for what seemed like eternity, before I realized what had happened. I noticed that, in the frenzy, Andy had dropped the pellet gun. I quickly grabbed it and ran after the two. It wasn't hard to follow them. Tommy's dragging leg made a distinct trench in the mulch of the woods, and my brother's screams were loud enough to follow. Anyone that heard them probably thought we were just messing around, because during this whole ordeal there was no sign of other people apart from us three. Uh, if you count Tommy as human. I followed them for what seemed like hours, until the screams led me to a cave that was set into a hill. It wasn't the waterfall cave, no, but it appeared to be man-made, an excavation of sorts, almost like a mine shaft. It was at this point that I seriously considered running back home and getting my dad, as I was terribly afraid of the dark. No, nix that. I was terribly afraid what, what was in the dark. I took out my flashlight, clicked it on, and began my descent. Ten feet in, I looked back at the opening, the evening sun flooding in with confidence only to be stopped by the overwhelming darkness of the earthly pit. My stomach churned, and I swallowed my fear. But when I turned back to face the darkness, my fear rose back up through my throat in an acidic burp, and tears formed in my eyes. Taking a deep breath, I stepped forward into the cave. The floor of the grotto was dirt and large rocks, and it was littered with refuse like old shoes, soda cans, and plastic bags. It smelled musty and wet, and I could hear the cliché drip of water ahead. I continued forward. Suddenly, my brother's cry erupted from the belly of the earthly tomb like a soul crying from hell. Years later, when I was on a military stint, I read a quote. It went something along the lines of, The last person a man thinks of when he's dying is his mother. And if that wasn't true, well... Mom! Mom! Please help me, Mom! <laughs> And he cried out from the bowels of the earth. Fear slithered beneath my skin like parasitic worms, and I just froze. Listening to my brother's wailing. After crying a bit, I ran blindly into the cave, following the drag marks in the dirt with my flashlight. After about two minutes, the tunnel opened to a vast chamber with a small lake of runoff water in it. Towards the edge of the lake, on the near side, a small island, maybe ten feet long, rose up above the stagnant water, and on it was Andy, 
unconscious and sprawled out like a rag doll. My light shone off the black water as I scurried over to him, my panic steps echoing off the walls of the cavern. Andy! Andy, wake up! Andy! He sputtered into consciousness, his eyes coming back from the cloudy cover of sleep. He saw me, and his face went pale as terror flooded through him and came out in his voice. Oh, he's in here, Jack. It's Tommy. It's really fucking Tommy. He didn't die. He's alive. His face is gone, Jack. His face is gone. And he spat the words out quickly as if they tasted vile in his mouth, which I'm sure they did. No sooner had he set these words forth than a large splash came from the lake. I shone the light to see Tommy, standing at an odd angle in the water, the dark surface of the lake reflecting his pale, glistening being. The black hole in his face made it look like I was staring through his head and into the cave beyond. His eyes, once so green and bright, were now black and bloodshot. The blisters that had looked red and angry in the sunlight now took on a smaller, more pinkish character, which I assumed was due to the cold of the cave. I noticed something else, too, something that I found more disturbing than his lack of nose, his lack of genitals. Where Tommy Jr. should have hung beneath his whitewashed legs was not but a bump riddled with scabs. And he turned around to see Tommy, and when Tommy saw him, he leaped for him, water and snot flying from his nasal orifice as he sprinted towards us in the shallow water, kicking up waves and waking with his presence. I pulled out the pellet gun and fired round after round, but they didn't seem to affect him even as blood oozed from his milky flesh. If anything, it just made him angrier. We ran from the island, but Tommy bounded in front of us and knocked me down. As I hit the ground, I remember thinking that this was where I was going to die. This was where it would all end. Tommy stood over me on all fours, his face inches from mine. Snot from his nose dribbled down into my mouth. A vile, salty brine. I cried out, but that made him wail with me, sending more of his phlegm and survivor into my gaping maw. The urge to vomit was overpowering, but I managed to swallow it back. Our eyes managed to make contact, and it seemed, for a moment, that I was looking at Tommy. I swear I saw the black peeled back and revealed traces of his emerald eyes, saw the soft smile return to his lips, the glow of joy emit from his pale, sweaty cheeks. And, just like that, it was gone. Tommy wailed one more time and I saw his top lip had a massive gouge in it that went into his upper palate and stopped just between his eyes, where the top of his nose would have been. Suddenly, Tommy was bashed from over me. Andy held a massive rock and kept slamming it in as hard as he could. I grabbed a smaller rock and joined once I realized what he was doing. The wails from Tommy were different from his predatory cries as we smashed his chest, his limbs, and his face with the rocks, sending his howls of agony bouncing off the walls only to be played alongside the squelches and snaps and pops of his body in a grotesque orchestra of misery and pain. I felt nothing but rage, knowing that this beast was not Tommy, that what I saw in the beast's eyes was the spirit of Tommy dying happily, knowing that he had seen his friends one last time before the monster took over. The body was alive, but Tommy had died long ago. We pounded away at the beast like lumberjacks to a tree. It thrashed and kicked every movement cracking its limbs even more and sending moist crunches to join the macabre symphony of wails. After about thirty seconds of smashing him, Andy picked the beast up by its thinning black hair and dragged it, howling and screaming, to the water's edge. You... you are not Tommy. Tommy is dead. 
and with that he shoved the beast's face into the water. The creature tried to gasp for air, but it just resulted in pathetic snorts and sobs, like a pig who knows it's going to the slaughter. The broken body of the beast thrashed a little bit more, and, in the glow of my flashlight, I saw it come to a stop, a final twitch, and then the beast had stopped forever. The meat of the body just relaxed and melted to the ground, losing all tension. We sat, panting, on the island. We were both covered in grime and muck when I pulled out a slim gym. As I looked at it, my heart sank, because I realized that we could have probably just lured him off with the jerky. <sighs> Tears whirled in my eyes as I handed it to my brother and pulled another one out for myself. He didn't ask why we were eating, and I didn't either. It just felt like the right thing to do. After we regained our mentality, or what we could of it anyway, we searched the cave. The lake was roughly a hundred feet across, with the chamber being about a hundred and fifty. In one corner, we found a stack of animal bones. Small things, like squirrels and coyotes and armadillos. And fish. We found a pile separate from the main one, that consisted only of flat-head catfish skulls. A little bit of Tommy had survived for longer than I'd thought. Continuing our search, we found a damp spiral notebook that was filled with writing. After flipping through it briefly and confirming that it belonged to Tommy, I sat down and read it. Oh, it recounted a year of abuse by his uncle. At first it was normal abuse things, hitting name-calling. Then it moved to cigarette burns and cuts. The escalation was, oh, I have no words. The first of the final entries was dated roughly two days after the last time we'd seen Tommy. For everything past this point in the journal, Tommy had disappeared from our lives. It is below as I read it for I still have the notebook to refer back to. My uncle, my uncle did the unspeakable things to me yesterday. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him for what he did to me. I'm going to kill him. I immediately felt sick to my stomach as I read the entry and I instantly felt like I shouldn't continue reading. But I had to know. Know what? I still don't have an answer to that. An entry from two days later read as follows. I can still feel him. I don't know who to tell. He'll just kill me if I do. I've got to do that to him first. I can still feel him. I haven't left my room in two days, haven't eaten, haven't slept. I can't look at myself in the mirror. I've been pissing in bottles, but every time I do, it brings me nothing but pain. Jeez, why did he do this to me? Why did he do this to me? God, I swear, I swear to Christ, I'm going to kill him. And I'm going to cut that part off me as well. I have a box cutter next to me and a clothes iron to seal the wound. I'm going to make sure that asshole can't touch me again for the rest of the time he's alive, which won't be long. I'm going to chop him up and leave a hand or something of mine with his body so they won't come looking for me if they discover him. If. But first, God forgive me, but I know you probably can't. If what I'm about to do kills me and this journal is found, please. Whoever you are, please take care of that bastard, please. My crotch tightened, and I felt mock pain as I read the passage. Kind of like when you see someone smash their finger with a hammer, and your finger tenses up. 
I looked back over at Tommy's corpse while Andy sat behind me with his back to me, munching away on Slim Jims, unaware of the horror I was reading. The next entry was nearly a month after the first. I can't believe I'm alive. Why didn't he just kill me? I'm so weak in writing this, but gosh, how can one man be so evil? He busted into my room right after I'd finished the entry, and I hid it between my mattresses. I had the box cutter in my hands, and I was ready to make the cut when suddenly he was standing over me. He hit me hard in the head, hard enough to throw me back onto the bed, and he did it again. Oh, he bit it off. He bit, he bit it off. <laughs> I can barely move around the house, and I only do so when he isn't home. The phones are dead, the TV doesn't work, and the water is turned off. Jeez, I hurt so much. Why does he hate me? I threw the book down into the earth. Andy started at the sound, spooked by my sudden outburst. Hatred burned in me as did fear and dread and the utmost trepidation. I looked over at the body of my old friend, shamed for how I'd aided in his death, shamed for how I had given such a poor, unfortunate soul even more pain in his passing, which he had no doubt wanted to be peaceful. This was, however, not the case, as I found out once I mustered the courage to pick up the book again. The next entry describes the killing. I cut my foot off and buried it with his limbs in the septic tank. After losing my manhood to this evil piece of shit, a foot was nothing too awful. That was a week ago. I was too weak to bury his torso, so I just covered it with a hay bale and a little bit of time. Next week, when I regain my strength, I'm going to drop his head down a well near the Roberts place. They'll probably never find it because it's old and it's deep too. I slid his throat while he was in his bedroom, writing on his laptop. I'm still in the house and I don't want the door left open, so I'm putting a shint in it so it won't open again. <laughs> yeah, Paul. Fuck you. I flipped to the last page, which was dated two months after the one I'd just presented. It's been two months since I did it. I'm sitting at the mouth of my new home and soon to be my grave. I found a cave in the woods about four miles away from my house. After I buried Paul, I took his forty-five from under his bed. I'm going to go into this cave and blow my brains out after I finish this. I felt numb as I closed the book for the last time that day. Everything seemed so distant, so insignificant at that point. War, poverty, people being slaughtered in the Middle East, the cancer patients in my school. God, it all seemed so meaningless and stupid. I didn't let Andrew read the book as I knew that Tommy was his best friend. He never set eyes on the notebook after that. I made sure of it. I figured that Tommy had misfired the bullet and it, and it had blown his face off instead of blowing his brains out. The damage to his brain from the round probably sent him into a mental breakdown, coupled with all the pain that he'd endured. I think that it was at this point that Tommy died and the beast took over. We eventually made our way home and never spoke a word of it to our parents. I don't know how we didn't go crazy. I guess we just became numb. For nearly half a year, everything was a grey blur. School happened. Life happened. No, oh, we stopped going fishing. I still have the notebook, and I don't read it very often. I don't even know why I read it in the first place. Maybe it's to discover, to figure out why his uncle had hated him so much. Why there was such darkness about him. I still have found no answers. I don't think I ever will. Andy has remained blissfully unaware of the book. So he remembers killing the monster that killed Tommy in a slightly heroic assault. 
I, however, remember the fact that the beast was Tommy somewhere, and we killed two living things that night.